People are usually happier when I leave. But <clears throat> Hear the reading of the Word of God. It's a long reading. Bear with me. Out of deference and respect for the words from the Gospel of John. Jesus realized the Pharisees were keeping score on baptisms that he and John were performing, although it was Jesus' disciples who were doing the actual baptizing, not Jesus himself. And they posted the score that Jesus was ahead, and they turned him and John into rivals in the eyes of the people. So Jesus left the Judean countryside, and he went back to Galilee. To get there, he had to pass through Samaria. He came into Sychar, a Samaritan village that bordered the field Jacob had given his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. Jesus said, would you mind giving me a drink? His disciples had gone off into the village to the 7-Eleven to buy food for lunch. The Samaritan woman taken aback by his request, said, what's this that you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan, and a woman, for a drink? Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh living water. The woman said, sir, you don't even have a bucket. This well is deep. How are you going to get what you're calling living water? Are you better than our ancestor Jacob, the man who dug this well so long ago and drank from it, he and his sons, their livestock, and passed it down now to us? Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water is going to get thirsty again and again and again. Anyone who drinks the water I give will never be thirsty again, not ever. The water I give will be like an artesian spring. It will just gush fountains of endless life. The woman said, sir, I'd like some of that water. That way I'll never get thirsty again. I won't ever have to come back to this well again. Go call your husband, he said. Come back, we'll talk about it. I don't have a husband, she said. That's nicely put. <laughs> I have no husband. Do you actually have had five, haven't you? And the man you're living with now? You haven't bothered to get married. You spoke the truth there, sure enough. Sir, you must be a prophet. So, so tell me this, would you? Our ancestors worshiped God on, on this holy mountain, Gerizim, but you Jews say Jerusalem is the place for worship. Isn't that right? Oh, dear woman, the time's coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here at this mountain nor under any compulsion to go up to Jerusalem. The worship you're doing now is sort of like guessing in the dark. The Jews live more in the clear light of God's day, but God's way of salvation is being made known through the Jews. And the time is coming. In fact, let me just tell you, it's here now. When what you've called Gerizim, Jerusalem, the controversy about worship place, worship style, that's not going to matter. Where you go to worship won't matter. It's who you are. And it's the way you live before God that matters. You see, worship needs to engage your full spirit. And it needs to be in the firm reality of authentic self-disclosure. Or maybe that line should be translated, your worship must be energized by the Holy Spirit, whom you've never really heard of yet, and it must be in pursuit of the one who will come to be known as the way, the life, and the truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him and their worship. 
Those who worship God must do it out of the depths of their being, their spirits, their true selves in adoration. The woman said, I don't know how to do that. I do know the Messiah is coming. And I've heard that when he arrives, everything's going to be made clearer. I am the Messiah, he said. And things can come clear for you now. The story of the woman at the well, I call it extreme makeover, personal edition. Don't know what kind of house she came from that day. Don't know what she left home looking for that day, other than water. But she was going to run into far more than she could have anticipated. That's, that's the way I am every day. God sometimes has agendas that I'm not aware of. And, and God sometimes puts people in my path that I didn't anticipate. And frankly, your life is just like mine in that regard. I don't know why you chose to be at Lipscomb. Uh, maybe you had no choice. Maybe mom and dad said, if you want us to pay for it, that's where you're going. Maybe you chose to be here, and, and you're here because it's where you want to be, and you, you want your education to be in a certain kind of, of faith context. But what I do know is that day after day after day on this campus, and day after day is, as you leave this campus, weekend after weekend as you make choices about how to spend time, God is God in all those times and all those places. This particular story of an extreme makeover, a woman who, who needed to meet somebody and a woman who needed to clear up some of the confusion that she confesses to in the dialogue here, it, it's been an interesting story to believers for a long time. Um, that there are Roman catacomb paintings that go back, whoops, I jumped that one. There's a Roman catacomb painting that goes back to the fourth century. Clearly, it's an attempt on their part to represent the case of the woman at the well. There is an Eastern Orthodox painting from the Middle Ages, again, the same scene. The one that I would maybe linger at for just a moment, if I can learn to control this thing. Steve Joyner and Mark Black and I happened to be in Croatia together last year, and I don't know if they followed up on the introduction we were given to an artist named Hu Chi. This happens to be his representation of the woman at the well. Hu Chi lived in communist China and was sent to one of those re-education camps. And because he had artistic gifts and abilities, a lot of his time was spent in painting those huge, huge images of Chairman Mao. And when he was given some advanced training at a university in China, he saw in an old magazine, actually the pages that he found had been stuffed under a mattress, some scenes that he had no background for understanding. They were medieval art picturing biblical scenes. He was so fascinated with the story as he saw it represented in art, he started doing research to find out who these characters were and what the story was. And he had an extreme makeover, an encounter with Christ in communist China, became a Christian. Later had the opportunity to, to leave China, and he lives in America now, lives in Minneapolis, St. Paul, has a gallery there. He's, he's, he's painted in Chinese style all the major scenes of the Bible to which he's been attracted. It's, it's a fascinating story. It begins with John telling us that Jesus left Judea, started back to Galilee because of this rivalry, at least in the minds of many, between him and John. He and John weren't rivals. But you know how people are. They, they tended to pit one against the other who's drawing the larger crowds, who's having the most baptisms. John says, but he had to go through Samaria. Actually, he didn't. It, it was the straighter line between Judea and Galilee. But the typical way that 
a Jew would have gone from Judea to Galilee would have been to go over into the Transjordan and north and back across because Samaritan territory, well, Jews just stayed out of Samaritan territory. It wasn't hospitable. And just by passing through it, you contracted uncleanness. Uh, Dr. Camp, your story of Israel class somewhere with a professor here, you'll learn about 721 BC, you'll learn about the Assyrians, you'll learn about land grants to pagans, you'll learn about what happens. But against that background, Samaria was alien territory and Jews avoided it. John means something other than geography and travel when he says Jesus just had to go that way. It was one of those divine appointments. He understood it. The woman with whom he would meet didn't. So Jesus and his disciples are traveling north from Judea to Galilee. And as they travel, they come near a Samaritan village, one where Jacob's well was. And Jesus was fully human. Yes, he's fully God, but in the incarnation, he, he takes on not the semblance of humanity, but he, he takes on humanity, tempted in all the ways we are, subject to frustration, subject to heat and fatigue. So here traveling in hot, dry areas, he's tired. He's exhausted. And he sends the traveling bunch in to find a convenience store somewhere where they can get something they can make a meal off of, and he decides he's just going to wait here. He knows why he's waiting. They may be wonder. And as he is sitting at the well, recuperating, the woman who has an appointment that she doesn't know about appears. I'm not doing that. A Samaritan woman comes to draw water. Samaritan. I've already given you some background on that. Jews and Samaritans. John says, Jews and Samaritans looked at each other as if the other was a dog, the other is unclean, the other is unworthy of attention, the un well, the other is just the other. <laughs> They'll never be part of me and who I am. So she's a Samaritan, but it's as great a barrier and gap between them that, that she's a woman. Jesus has begun to be called rabbi. And one of the debates among the rabbis was whether a self-respecting rabbi can in public talk even to his mother or his sister. So there would have been no debate. Could a self-respecting rabbi spend time, especially out in an area of some isolation, talking to a woman whose name he doesn't know, who is in fact a Samaritan of all things. Jesus apparently sees the woman coming and shocks her. I guess first just by treating her with enough respect to speak to her at all. But then the shock is, mind if I drink from your cup? Now, I grew up in the country, and snuff was a big thing out in the country. And my Aunt Lucy, well, she, she had lots of it. And I'd see her every Sunday afternoon. Yeah, you know where this one's going, don't you? And, and Aunt Lucy used to have a little ring around the, not collar, but, but the snuff ring. And, and Aunt Lucy always wanted to give me a kiss when she saw me. I always look forward to those kisses. Well, actually, I didn't, because they were always sloppy kisses, and they always left a mark. The idea of a Jew putting his lips on the drinking cup, the drinking gourd, the drinking ladle that a Samaritan had used in my case, it was just that I wasn't particularly fond of snuff. In his case, it would have been he accepted her uncleanness. Eventually, he's going to accept mine too. But that day, he accepts whatever uncleanness 
attaches to her has shocked her. You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan, and, and you're willing to ask me for a drink, and Jesus says, oh, if you only knew. If you only knew. Jesus said, I have water. I'll, I'll call mine living water. I have water that if you knew who I was and asked me to give it to you, I would. And if you had that water, oh, you'd never be thirsty again. John has a way in his gospel of taking terms like light and air and water and spiritualizing them, drawing a spiritual lesson out of them. Well, Jesus does that here and John catches it. He's talking about something quite different than anything you can get in a bucket from the bottom of a well. He's talking about what the Bible calls eternal life, living as God really meant for us to live, life that's authentically and truly human, a life that is, it's going to tur turn out this woman has had a difficult time with. If you, if you knew who you're talking to, dear lady, you'd ask me, I'd be giving you a drink. <coughs> Why don't you go get your husband? And th that would make the situation a bit more respectable, right? In terms of what I've already explained. Why don't you go get your husband and, and we'll just sit here and we'll all drink some water and I'll, I'll tell you about the other water. And the woman says, well, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, yeah, no. Let's see, three, four. You've had, you've, had, you've had tough luck at marriage, haven't you? You've had five, if my count is correct. And it's not that you've given up on men or given up on trying to have a relationship. You have a man in your life now that you're living with him. And I guess life's made you such a cynic about marriage, haven't, haven't bothered to get married. That's a pretty courageous thing for Jesus to do, to cross that line with her, not to insult her, but to test her. Because Jesus is going to talk about worshiping God in spirit and truth, and that doesn't really mean with a good attitude and by the rules. It means in, in transparent authenticity. Can you worship God by being honest about the mess? Life sometimes is the extreme makeover you need in your life. And could you worship God the Father by allowing God the Spirit to empower you to relate to the God who is truth before you? I do think that sort of Trinitarian theology may very well be sort of beneath the surface in this text, but I know the other is there. Dear lady, five, living with, not married, can we still continue to talk? Because really what we need to talk about is not marriage. It, it is worship. And the, the hour has come that, that worship can really happen in a way that's meaningful and full. And when the, when the subject of worship gets on the, tech, uh, gets on the table... The text says, she said, oh yeah, let's talk about worship. Uh, we Samaritans, we worship up on Mount Gerizim. You, you Jews, you worship in Jerusalem. Let's have a church fight. Religion works that way a lot of times. We've invented lots of things to fuss about in the name of God to avoid the real issue I have to deal with every day and that you're having to deal with and will have to for as long as you live. Authenticity before God. How messed up I can be, how messed up things are, 
how desperate I am for help that I don't know where to go and find. So Jesus says, with all the mess and the baggage in your life, here's what God asks of you. Go and scramble all those eggs and come back and we'll talk. Now, that's what church sometimes asks of us. Jesus said, Gerizim, Jerusalem, divorce and remarriage, church polity, weekly communion, worship style, parsing the details of baptism, understanding the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There'll be time and a place to get to some of those things if they're really important to you, but the issue every day for slaking your thirst, taking the dryness out, is going to be, can you just come before God and say how needy you are? with a confidence that in your neediness, God will supply, and dear lady, that's the water I'm talking about. Uh, the Holy Spirit and the presence of God through His presence will pour out refreshing water and the mess and the stuff that you figure you need to straighten out, some of which probably can't be straightened out. God will work with you right where you are to take you where you need to be. Hear me, who knows but that where you are today is exactly where you must be for God to do with you what He plans to do and wants to do with you. So out of this extreme makeover, we learn two or three things. People who seem not to matter always matter to Jesus. This woman didn't matter much to the disciples who were traveling with Jesus. They were shocked, probably even offended that he was talking to her when he got back. Jesus, Jesus said, no, this is a conversation. I had to come this way so I could have it. And as old as those racial, ethnic hatreds are, as much problem as the first century church had with Jew and Gentile, as well as Samaritan and Jew, we're, we're still facing it today. Let's not, let's not let that be a problem for us on this campus. Let's not, let's not be Protestant and Catholic and charismatic and Methodist and Church of Christ and Pentecostal. And let's not be black or white or Malaysian or Australian or American. Oh, we are those things. And it's fine that we are. We celebrate that we are those things, but our identity can be found in Christ and not in those things. And let's not let the traditions and the baggage that we brought with us mean more than the opportunity that we have of truth authenticity with one another. Hang around me much or be in one of my class, you're going to find out how many warts and flaws I have. Other professors have them too. And so it's not surprising that if you have one or two in your life or a skeleton in your closet, hey, we all do. And if it would help you be more honest about yours, I'll stand up and tell you half a dozen of mine and I'll do it in chapel with the lights on and because that's really all God wants of any of us is that kind of honesty and He's ready to begin doing His work. But the last thing I want us to do is to continue here or anywhere else just playing church. And so this woman encountered by Jesus knowing that He said something I needed to hear. He's a prophet. And if I could bring myself to the point that He's just challenged me to go... Could things really be different? Would he really open some avenue to God that I haven't thought about or explored? 
she runs back to the town and, and becomes, can you believe this, a female evangelist. She runs back to town and tells everybody in town, I left home this morning not having any idea that I'd run into somebody like this, but I did, and he's still out there. Don't take my word for the kind of... Per- Go and see for yourself. I'd love for us to be a go-see-for-yourself kind of place. I can't do your thinking for you. I don't want to. I don't want the responsibility. I'm not going to let you do my thinking for me. But around this place, if we deserve to exist at all, we're having conversations about, we're having unanticipated encounters with, we're bumping into Jesus, not just in the Bible class, in the physics class, in the lit class, in the math class. We're bumping into Jesus through experiences we're sharing with one another. And in those contexts, that kind of authenticity before God, He'll show up. Campus revival. City revival. Worldwide revival. One person meets Jesus. One. And it's been worth our taking the trip where we had to go through Samaria and take the class and be in chapel and be on this campus. And we could say to anybody else, just go and meet him. I'll take my read of who he is. Go and meet him. Check him out. Something wonderful just might happen in your life too. Holy God, for the unexpected encounters that may yet be part of this day for us or this semester or this academic year, thank you. You'll catch us off guard. You'll do it through the most unlikely of people. You'll do it in the most unusual of settings. It'll be awkward. But God, you will reveal yourself. So please let us, with what Dr. Lowry at times calls intentional and courageous and gracious faith, let us be such a community for one another where these encounters will feed us all with living water. And this place, this campus, this school will become a a place of nourishing and refreshing for our spirits. And from this place, the presence of Christ may radiate to all the people we'll ever contact and all the places you may take us for your glory. Through Christ, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.